My name is Ian, a lecturer from SP School of Architecture and the Built Environment. I'll be your moderator for today. This is part of a series of webinars that Singapore Polytechnic is organizing for the purpose of engaging the industry. Singapore engagement, industry engagement is an important mission of SP. Our aim is to uplift the capabilities of SMEs to help them transform by enhancing their productivity, innovation, and building talents for the industry. SP's main approach is to engage the industry and also using our pedagogical model of mindset, skill sets, and behavior. To find out more, you can write to us through span at sp.edu.sg. Also, you can follow us at our social media platforms to find out more on our latest happenings and partnership opportunities. Um, before we start, uh, just a little housekeeping for everyone. If you have any questions during the webinar sessions, please go to the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, it's just below, or the Zoom control panel and submit your questions through the platform. Feel free to raise your hand if you face any technical issue so that our organizers can assist you as well. Let's begin. We are constantly facing two forces that promise to fundamentally change the nature of our world and our industry. One, changing demographics and population growth. Two, the global pandemics have reshaped the way that we work as remote working looks to perhaps become our new normal. Today, let's try our panel experts, Kelly Higgins, interior design leader as Carsten, Mr. Randy Deutsch, university professor and practicing architect based in Chicago. And last but not least, Josh De Stefano. Southwest Regional Virtual Design and Construction Leaders at DPR. They'll be able to, for you to know, to learn more about what the future holds for you, your industry, and your world. Without further ado, let me introduce you to Ms. Kelly Higgins. Um, Kelly, please. Thanks, Ian. And thanks for inviting me to join you here this morning. As Ian mentioned, uh, my name is Kaylee Higgins and I am the interior design leader for Customs, a boutique architecture and interior design company based in Sydney, Australia. In my role, I focus largely on workplace and commercial design, everything ranging from a five-storey executive office through to a 23-storey building refurbishment. I have spent most of my career working in interior design, but am also a registered architect here in New South Wales. Outside of work, my hobby also relates to my job. I'm a writer and blogger at the Midnight Lunch, which um, is currently been having a bit of a holiday, but I do hope to relaunch soon. I'm a frequent speaker on BIM and technology, as well as sometimes described as a thought leader and futurist. And I am part of the Digital Built Environment Institute's Built Committee for the Built event here in ANZ. And you can find me, um, as I mentioned, at my blog or from various Twitter accounts, at Kaylee Higgins is the main one that I use from day to day. But uh, you'll also find me tweeting about BIM from time to time on BIM Minions. And I also do occasionally tweet from the Built Event account. Today, we've been asked to consider the future of construction from two different perspectives. One is population growth. This one for me as an Australian is quite interesting and, and perhaps I have quite different views on this than other countries. Um, Australia, we are a highly urbanised population, but we actually, due to COVID, are projected to suffer from a population, a decreasing population this year because our population is heavily dependent upon migration. There are other countries like Japan in a similar situation. I think one of the key issues that we need to consider in terms of population is the fact that our economic systems today are dependent upon population growth for economic growth. And that's uh, certainly something that into the future will start to play a part in 
how that needs to change. The second aspect we've been asked to consider today is the pandemic. The pandemic has an urgency about it which forces reaction much faster than on topics like population growth. At the same time, I think it's really hard to know what the long-term impacts of the pandemic might be, but certainly today I'm going to touch on that. And I added a third topic, climate change. I think what we'll find in a lot of the things that all three speakers are going to speak about today is that alongside of pandemic and population growth, climate change is and sustainability is a key driver for our industry at the moment. And we can't really talk about the future of our industry without talking about climate change. Today, I'm going to be talking about 10 trends which are um, coming from my work in interior design, but across all aspects really of the built environment. And I think um, this recent quote from Sir Norman Foster is pretty true that these trends were already in evidence prior to the events of this year, but the way that the world is reacting and these trends might move forward could be quite changed due to the pandemic. So the first trend is flexibility. I think we've all seen that this year in terms of work. Almost everyone will have had the experience of working from a different place to normal. And moving forwards, we're going to see that that remains a feature of our work. Whether that means less people are working in a head office, more people are working from home, or we see a rise in what's frequently termed a hub and spoke model, where um, you still have a head office, but you have more smaller regional offices or staff go to work in co-working spaces. Um, there's also then the aspect of time. One of the impacts that the lockdown and particularly the shutdown of schools and childcare centres has had is that people have had to uh, manage to juggle their family responsibilities with their work. And so we've increased our flexibility in working hours. And I've certainly seen a rise in talk about what's called asynchronous working, where people are working at different times, not just different places. So the ability to work across time zones or the ability to have some staff working, you know, from nine till five, while other staff might not work until 12, uh, people might work on the weekends. I think that this is um, a really great in terms of flexibility and how we might best tap into the capabilities of the workforce. I think though it does present a lot of challenges for employers. I think moving forwards, the model that we're getting towards potentially with a hybrid model of work from home, work from anywhere, or work from the office, work at different times, it does get harder to manage and it's gonna provide challenges moving forwards. Obviously, we've seen spaces become more flexible as well. We need to be more flexible in the workplace to provide the space that we need, but people have obviously found they need to be more flexible in their homes and perhaps their homes are changing from living area to workspace over a 24 hour cycle because not everyone necessarily has the space in their homes for a dedicated workspace. The next trend I want to talk about is global versus local. So obviously in recent years, we've really seen a rise in globalization of design. You can no longer tell what city uh, fit out is in. in. In fact, this was Melbourne and Mumbai, these two images, but I could look at the second one and it could just as easily be in Melbourne. It's interesting though, because we do still have very strong cultural differences between the USA, Asia, Australia, and Europe as to how we actually do our work. And if you look at the back of house areas where the desks are, you're likely to find a much bigger difference than in the fun front of house breakout spaces and client areas. And I think it's gonna be very interesting to see what impact the pandemic has in different regions moving forwards. And I think we could start to see actually even more divergence from this global nature of design, not because borders are closed, but because different countries are having such different experiences of the pandemic this year. The other aspect of both the increasing amount of technology, which the pandemic has 
highlighted and move forwards at such a quick pace is the option to actually live and work in different places. In Australia in particular, we've seen a massive rise, a, a move to regional locations. People are moving out of the inner city and they're moving to um, smaller towns and regional centres because now it no longer matters where you live if you can do your work from anywhere and perhaps you only have to go to the city once a week, once a fortnight, once a month, it uh, has allowed people to live in different areas. And I think, again, this was something people knew before the pandemic could be a future possibility. And it's something I think we're gonna see growing. And obviously it starts to impact on that urbanization and it starts to open up opportunities for people to live in different places and for employers to get the best staff and get the best employees regardless of location. One trend that we've really seen in interior design in recent years is what I've called blending. So it's where different spaces are becoming more like one another. So if you'd asked me early in 2020 what was the biggest new trend in workplace design, I would have said beds. Um, this particular example is a mattress company, so maybe it makes a bit of sense, but probably in the first two months of this year, I saw half a dozen different office fit out images with some sort of beds or, you know, big lounge beds involved. More commonly, though, we're seeing spaces where you can't differentiate between whether a space is an office or a home, whether it's an office or a bar. In fact, both of those spaces are offices. I would be quite happy, I have to say, to work in either of those. And this is a very interesting one. This is a, a COVID response to co-working where these small glass cubicles become both an office and a home. I'm not sure that this would be a popular option certainly in a country like Australia where people are used to a bit more space but um, the idea is these glass cubicles you, you work by yourself and uh, there is a fold down bed and a kitchenette so you don't need to risk public transport and you can just stay inside your little glass pod but I'm not sure how that would go for a 10-week lockdown. But we are certainly seeing the blending of the workplace into the home as well. From here on in, I think we are going to see a growing number of home offices. Obviously, we've seen a lot of people do that in a hurry as a response to COVID and the lockdowns, but it's going to perhaps become a more normal feature of many more houses and people are probably going to be investing more money in their home offices than they were in the past. And so the home will start to blend and become more like the office. The fourth trend is wellness. Wellness has in some ways probably taken over from sustainability in the last um, 12 months or so as a really hot topic in interior design in particular. So wellness can cover everything from your actual workspace design, from whether it's spaces to improve the mental well-being and provide breakouts and lounges and different kinds of spaces as we've just seen through to biophilic design based in nature as well as nature itself. We've also seen a rising trend for uh, physical spaces, whether that's end of trip facilities, which are getting very glamorous um, and very luxurious through to uh, yoga studios or just the provision of yoga classes by landlords in empty spaces. And then at its most basic, the use of stairs for people to get around. It will be interesting, I think, to see how the pandemic actually impacts some of these spaces and whether we continue to see these kind of shared facilities within buildings. At this point, certainly in Australia, we're not seeing a slowdown in requests for these kind of facilities. But we've also seen growing interest from, um, I guess it's not so much a workplace design issue, but from companies who are integrating also the mental aspects of well-being into what they provide for their staff. And then this year we've seen how uh, the pandemic can also play its part. There's a lot of overlap in these issues of wellness in terms of providing touch-free, sufficient space, quality of air conditioning, and even through to antimicrobial surfaces and additional cleaning. One of the key aspects we've seen over the last few years in, in the growth of wellness is the well-building rating. The well-building rating is an international rating system and has a large number of projects registered around the world. 
Uh, there's currently 29 projects actually registered in Singapore. And this image is one of the local projects uh, in Singapore by M. Mosler, the Zendesk office. The interesting thing about the well building rating is even though it's considered a building rating, it actually covers a lot of the aspects of mental well-being and overall staff well-being. It looks like, as well as looking at, you know, physical activity spaces, it will look at things like what kind of food you provide in your cafe, what kind of conditions do you have around staff working hours and overtime. So it's a very diverse system. And I think we're going to see the growth of that rating system. The fifth trend is co-working and co-living. This is obviously a really interesting trend that has been taking off for a while. And again, when you look at this image, the aspect of blending is really clear. You can't often tell the difference between a co-working space and a co-living. This image is actually a co-living space. So I think um, it's obviously been a real growth area over a number of years. Uh, and there's a lot of doubt over how co-working and co-living will move forwards due to the pandemic. It's one of the areas I think it really is too early to make predictions. And again, it could be very regionally biased depending upon the different countries. Uh, it certainly offers us great solutions to address issues such as flexibility, population growth, providing different opportunities for ways for people to live. And I think it's good to see that the providers of these kind of co-living spaces in particular haven't just said, oh no, pandemic means we can't do this kind of project anymore. So yeah, it's going to be an interesting space to watch. The sixth trend is consumer technology. So really, ever since the iPhone was launched, the ease of which consumers are able to relate to technology has just been growing and the way in which we use technology has been changing. The fact that it is just so portable and it's just easy, you don't have to have specialised space to set up anymore for video conferencing. People use so many different modes of chat. It's changing the way that we live and work and it is having its impact as well on the design of spaces. We're seeing more and more um, rooms that are dedicated to things like virtual reality but at the same time we're seeing less and less rooms that are dedicated to video conferencing as platforms like Zoom and Teams become more popular as opposed to 10 years ago when you needed a highly sort of specialised software and camera and setup people are now are able to do their video conferencing anywhere. On the kind of flip side of that it means we actually need to think about the amount of enclosed space we're providing, whether that's in our homes or in our offices, because I think probably everyone's had the experience of being in an open plan office with someone else trying to run a Zoom call and it just doesn't work. Though we still can't replicate a face-to-face -face collaboration quite often. It's difficult to have um, an informal coffee catch up and sometimes difficult to have a workshop depending on the sort of technology and the participants and how engaged people are. It's and technology is struggling to replicate some of the little everyday aspects of face to face working that we all so much take for granted, even with all the benefits. Smart buildings is, again, a trend that has been in evidence for some years, and it's one we're going to see keep growing and growing. Starting from the basics of building motion detection, light sensors, air conditioning, smart buildings can start to create a whole new level of user experience in how one actually deals with a building, as well as creating an amazing array of environmental benefits because they are so much more responsive to actual occupant loads and environmental conditions. From a touch-free automated entry experience where the lifts are controlled with your mobile phone, taking you straight to your locker destination, which is again opened via a mobile phone, to a desk which has been booked by a booking app, and the same app might tell your colleagues where you are and allow you to organise meetings. When you go to the meeting rooms, the lights will be set, the 
computers and IT know you're in there and they talk seamlessly to your devices. Preferences from everything from air conditioning to lighting can be personalised. Building apps can be used to create communities and connect people. There's just so many possibilities. And that's before we even get into data collection. And I think the actual use of the building data is going to be something that becomes much bigger in coming years, whether it's from uh, environmental tracking and understanding and optimising the building to the environment through to the opportunities it provides in uh, the current situation for contact tracing and the potential for gathering all this information about existing buildings and occupant behaviour and the potential that that might have for uh, future design simulations and our future understanding of how people use buildings. Number eight is automation. Automation is becoming more and more a component of design practice as well as smart buildings. From simple algorithms such as this one, which is from WeWork, where they're looking at how many desks fit into a room, through to many other aspects of design software, there's more and more about the way that we work that is being automated. And I know Randy is going to talk further about that today. Leading from automation is machine learning. So machine learning, again, is something that to date hasn't had a big impact on buildings and construction, but is certainly going to be a growing space. This particular example comes from WeWork and they gather a lot of data about meeting rooms. So they have an app which allows people to rate the meeting rooms and comment on them. And at the same time, they're also gathering data about the number of people using the room via the building sensors. Then by using a machine learning um, algorithm, they're analyzing the actual utilization rates of these meeting rooms. We're then able to compare the prediction by designers of the size of the meeting rooms and the mix that should be provided with the prediction by the computer. As you can see, the computer is a lot more accurate than the designers. However, I suspect that this year the computers might have been quite confused because the um, algorithms wouldn't have made any sense. The historical data would no longer apply. But as you can see, the use of machine learning would allow us to optimise and provide more heavily used spaces. So the 10th trend is artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence, again, is not really something we're yet seeing a lot of in building design, but we are starting to see examples that um, integrate into the design world. One of my favorites is this one where AI tried to name paint colors. And uh, some of those are quite, quite amazing. Um, a lot of them are not really colours you'd want to buy. I think my favourite one is called Stinky Bean. But can AI actually design? Um, this particular image is of an artist called Ada, an AI-powered robot. So she sculpts and paints and designs fashion using her robotic arm. So what will this mean for building design? I think it's certainly an area we're going to see a lot of growth in the future. And I know Randy's going to talk particularly about this today. So basically, in summary, I think many of these trends overlap with one another. You can certainly see I've mentioned co-working in a number of contexts today. There's overlaps between the technology and between things like flexibility or blending. And all of these trends are interlinked. They also, many of them influence how we can deal with these issues of population, pandemic and climate. So flexibility in when and where and how we work opens up opportunities for population growth to change and for urbanisation to change. It means that people don't necessarily have to even live in the country where they work. And I think this could have a really big impact on how our urban populations and our global population is able to live and work and how our economies could be structured. 
the growing use of technology also allows us not just to live and work in different places, but potentially also to um, come up with an economic model that's no longer dependent upon population growth for economic growth, but is instead dependent upon improved productivity. And it's not about the productivity of the hours we work, but the productivity of the systems that are in place. The pandemic has been an obvious uh, influence in all of these trends, and it's obviously impacted a lot this year on the way we live and work. As I mentioned earlier, I think it's going to be hard to say how long and how much this will impact us for. But in terms of highlighting our reliance on technology and the sort of changing nature of life and work and the changing nature of space, as well as the importance of well-being, I don't think those things are going to go backwards. I think we will keep going. Um, certainly, it, it's been a disruptive moment. We'll never go backwards to everyone working in the office the way that we might have taken for granted just a year ago. Climate change is something that's becoming uh, an, an accelerating issue of importance. And again, many of these trends can help us to better manage our space and better manage our buildings to have more environmentally responsive buildings and spaces and to better utilize space. One of the real key aspects as well of workspace is to think about how can that space be better utilized, not just when we're in lockdown, but also there's so much space that goes unused between workplaces and education facilities that are only used a small number of hours per day. So I think all of these trends are going to have a, a massive impact moving forwards on the future of construction. The pace of change is, however, in incredibly fast and perhaps accelerating. Certainly, as the pace of climate change accelerates, the urgency of the need to act will have to start to impact construction. And I think it can be very hard to tell how some of these trends will play out. I think um, not just in terms of sustainability, but also in terms of technology, we will reach a tipping point where the industry starts to change and move ahead very, very quickly. And, you know, something that may have seemed impossible three years ago might suddenly be possible today, whether that's in green buildings, where the Australian Green Building Council has just um, last week launched a new six-star rating tool and... It, a six star green star building in Australia now is expected to be net carbon zero. Three years ago, they thought that that would be an impossibility. The same is occurring in the field of AI. The developments are happening so quickly that the pace of change is hard to predict. And with that, I'm going to finish up because I know uh, Randy is gonna talk a lot more about AI and thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much, Kelly, for your sharing of the 10 trends and insights. It's particularly very useful for us, in particularly on the well building system, which is something new for us as well. Thank you so much, Kelly. Next, what we will do is that we will move on to Mr. Randy Deutsch. He's the, um, he's the uh, he's, um, university professor and also practicing architects in Chicago. So Randy, please. Thank you, Ian, very much. And good morning to you all for being here. I'll introduce myself in a moment, but first I just want to jump into one of the larger topics. We talked, um, we heard Kelly talk about, um, uh, in a wonderful way, about population growth, about climate change, and of course about the pandemics. And as she had mentioned, you're gonna hear a lot more from me about emerging technologies and in particular about AI and the rise of AI as a fourth major force. And just using an example right now of the current uh, ongoing pandemic that we are experiencing, very much experiencing here in the United States. I'm speaking to you from Chicago, Illinois in the United States um, right now. And um, when you look at this diagram, you're seeing a succession over a long period of time, millennia, in terms of the different pandemics in this arrow in the foreground shows you where we are today 
in relation to the number of cases and deaths in relation to the different pandemics over time. Another way of looking at it isn't in terms of time, but in terms of impact and size. And again, you see the Black Death in the upper left and so on um, in terms of size, and that's where we are today. Now, this is ongoing. It's not to minimize uh, or diminish the impact of the pandemic um, that we're experiencing in some places of the world more than others. Um, we have had to make major adjustments, as you heard Kelly talk about, um, not us not going back to um, offices that we had experienced even just a year ago um, or during lunch break in the cities that we work in, um, walking like this amongst the traffic um, in this level of density. Um, this was maybe never desirable, but it's something that we're not going to um, return to anytime soon. That said, even with the urban parks and the green spaces that we have available to us, we've had to make adjustments. We've had to tell people to walk in certain locations and of course, to socially um, distance from each other. Just to use one real quick example of why it's so difficult to be able to anticipate and make predictions about where things will go. One would imagine in the case of the pandemic that having very wide streets with very wide sidewalks and lots of greenery um, and lots of options of places where you can go. If somebody's walking immediately towards you, you have the opportunity to move over to one side and so on. This would make a lot of sense in the event of a pandemic. Now, on the other hand, in the event of climate change, which is equally ongoing and in many cases even more dire, um, it actually helps us to have narrower streets that are darker, that let less light in. And because they're narrower, um, as you understand, there's also uh, uh, prevailing breezes that occur on narrower streets, and therefore they're cooler. And so in, as the populations rise, we in many ways would actually prefer to have narrower, darker streets, or at least streets that are shaded. And it's hard to know which one be, uh, you know, to select. This is going to be a question that's gonna come up many times tonight in terms of, is there one that should take precedence over the other? Now, as you saw, Kelly, there's a number of trends that are going on. Um, this is from an architecture firm, um, uh, Trina Sanchefer at uh, Kaler Slater, an architecture firm in the United States. I don't wanna dwell on any one particular trend. There's also guidebooks developed by architects who supply ideas for how to, um, uh, deal with or handle the pandemic um, in terms of different opportunities for us to dine and to entertain and enjoy ourselves out in the world in a very safe way. And these ideas are making their ways into our buildings, of course, and not just in front of our buildings, but inside the buildings as well. And these are uh, trends and responses that should pop up naturally, but whether they have a long-term effect, whether they have a major effect over a long period of time, is it's too soon to say. So Kelly Slater uh, had the suggestion, for example, within a two bedroom um, apartment or condo, um, we may create 48 square foot, smaller spaces. They're not the size of bedrooms, but they're the size of different spaces where you can either exercise, or as you saw in Kelly's example, you might uh, take remote learning or you might work remotely in that little space. Um, you might write your novel or maybe the kids will play in some way. Um, these are things, these are great suggestions. These are very clever, they're very creative. Um, but again, whether building developers will invest in these small spaces and then if in the event the current pandemic diminishes, um, what do we do with these 48 square foot spaces would be a question that a lot of people would want to answer. Do you take those walls down and add them back to your unit? So where I'm going with this is um, just as architects have only really been around for about 150 years, um, the built environment that we're addressing today, we're talking about the future of the built environment, but if you just, I'm not a historian, but if you look at the past of the built environment, it's not much more than 11,500 years old. Um, as we see in this uh, very popular tweet just from the other day. Um, we, um, buildings and uh, human beings uh, impact on the natural environment, um, being able to shape it and determine how we're going to experience it, um, live, play and work within it is a relatively um, recent event. 
And for that reason, it's very hard to make predictions uh, going out hundreds of years into the future in terms of um, uh, what will happen um, based on um, what we know is happening today. And so a lot of times we end up experimenting. We come up with ideas, for example, with climate change, we have rising seas. And so therefore, should we go up higher on higher ground away from the water? Or should we build upon the water floating cities? And as you can see in this illustration, the idea is, is um, it's very much like an experiment um, by a scientist or a chemist in, in a Petri dish. Um, we don't know the answer. Um, we can leverage critical thinking to think in terms of the pros and cons. Um, we can think about our biases. We might like the idea of uh, living near water. And so that may be one of the reasons this idea may intrigue us. But in a way um, where we can't really predict how high the seas will go and how frequent, you know, how quickly they will rise, this may be the exact opposite of, of how we should handle this situation um, in the future of the built environment. So as a um, university pr professor, um, I, uh, you know, I'm not paid, for example, or um, rewarded for looking into the crystal ball. Um, uh, I am a licensed architect. Um, I'm a, you know, a, a keynote speaker. I'm a book author and an art, uh, artificial intelligence researcher. Um, but there are ways that we can look at trends and there are ways we can um, recognize what is happening today and, and um, help us all, you and I, anticipate what's coming on um, in the very near future so we can address it maybe five, 10 years before it happens. And so that's really the benefit of what I wanna share with you tonight. So again, um, we're not really allowed to uh, be Nostradamus and um, predict the future as uh, university professors. But what we can do and what we do very well as design professionals, um, especially those of us that have worked five or 10 years in the field, is you start to recognize the superpower that you develop is recognizing patterns or pattern recognition. And so one way that I recognize patterns, the type of research I do is called practice-based research. Um, it's very social. I spend a lot of time talking with architects, engineers, uh, contractors, and uh, vertically integrated companies like Katera or Skender, manufacturers of different products, especially for the construction industry, building owners, venture capitalists and software developers who are also at the other end that has an influence on the built environment, Regulation boards, for example, if you think about it, um, with the rise of AI, maybe we don't regulate architects anymore. Maybe we regulate the software. Maybe we regulate the buildings that we design and so on. And then finally, where I'm employed as a university professor, um, I meet with other universities and talk to other professors and students who um, have an inside view of the changes that are brewing uh, for the future. So I love this quote from Dan Anthony um, when he was a, a computational leader at MBBJ um, on the North, in the Northwest United States. There's a transformation that's coming that's poorly understood and we're all trying to understand and we all have our own particular way of trying to make sense of what is happening right now. My particular way of doing it is by writing books. So for the last decade, I've actually written six books. Uh, a couple of them are here. Um, the most uh, uh, recent technology book that I wrote was last year, it's called Super Users. And I'm going to be I'm sharing with you some examples from that book because I think the human um, uh, attribute uh, in conjunction with technology is really the answer that's going to enable us to be able to boldly and confidently um, address the challenge, all the challenges in terms of both um, population growth, climate change, um, in terms of uh, the pandemic, but also the rise of AI. It's our human um, interpersonal intelligence, um, or as Ian was talking about earlier, uh, the mindsets, um, the uh, skill sets and the behavior of humans that really uh, will help us move forward boldly. So any of the tools that I'm gonna share with you tonight is just a tool in a toolbox. This is what I tell my students and they really do come to believe it. So in other words, there is no one tool that's going to save the day. It doesn't matter what the tool is, even if it's your go-to favorite tool. Um, it's like uh, using a laptop as a hammer. Um, it's uh, seldom, seldom the most important thing 
um, to use all the time. But there is a best tool for every particular situation. And that does include analog tools such as moleskins and Montblanc pens with sepia ink um, and tracing paper. Um, we shouldn't leave any of those things out. But even going beyond the analog and digital tools are the three most important tools that design professionals you know, both academics um, in the form of students and professors, but also emerging professionals. Once students graduate from school and they go out into the workforce, the three tools that they need to add to their toolbox, if they haven't done so already, is critical thinking, creative thinking, and collaborative thinking. Those are the three superpowers that the architect in particular leverages together to be able to address any intractable or wicked problem that they face. So when you do graduate from school, the expectation is that you know, you're a digital native, whether you're a millennial or a generation Z, um, you're a digital native and therefore you're given more digitally oriented type of um, uh, activities or tasks to do within an architecture firm. And then as time goes on um, through practice, people become more important, technology lessons. At least that is the perception. The reality is starting day one from graduation, if not beforehand, people are actually equally important as technology. It is true that if you want, want to rise with an organization, you need to schmooze more or get along more or relate more or play golf or go boating more. All those things are very important. Um, uh, listening is very important and so on. Um, but these things don't just build from the time you're in college to the time you retire. They, they're actually things that uh, we need to do more and more of immediately right now. Just the way we design today. So as a lifelong building designer, I would have the bad behavior when given a design assignment for the first evening at least to go to a cafe or to my apartment and just start sketching. Sometimes I would empty my mind of all the bad ideas. So that way, when I went in the office the next day, um, only good ideas were, were remaining. Other times, it was just to, you know, try to get a jump on a project before others were involved. But that is bad behavior. The reality is, is the way we design now, whether we're working uh, remotely or we're working um, together, you know, within the bounds of social distancing, um, is we're, we're uh, working um, in tandem, in real time. And it doesn't take the structural engineer to make a structural suggestion. Anyone can, as long as we have the, the ability to think like others and anticipate that both their objections to our ideas, as well as suggestions that they may make using the language that they use, then um, we're in a situation where we can uh, critically and collaboratively uh, come up with very innovative ideas um, for the built environment. So as a university professor, when I teach design studio or a history class, I'm teaching buildings as buildings. When I teach the sophomore um, sequence of construction classes or the final semester professional practice course, I'm teaching buildings as documents. What we all need to be doing more of, as you heard Kelly talk about with the rise of big data and data, is to treat buildings as databases. So this is just a real quick model from my uh, data-driven design and construction book. It's one of the big ideas uh, in the book. It's this idea that we have public and private data over on the left side for the project developers. That includes um, building owners. It includes anyone who um, instigates or comes up with an idea for a building before they reach out to design professionals. Um, they have public and private data available to them. Um, on the other end, on the far right, are the uh, same owners in many cases, or if they, it's a developer who flips the building to somebody else, it's the occupants, um, it's the people who use the building and the neighbors who live around it. It's the people who are impacted by maintenance and operations, facilities, um, uh, who could benefit from the data that was there, the public and private data at the early instance. The problem are these white gaps that are between these circles. And what we need to work towards is uh, all becoming, in the architecture, engineering, and construction field, digital middlemen or middle women, or another way of talking about ourselves is in terms of becoming information intermediaries. Having the ability to take that data from the beginning and carry it through our documents and our models all the way through towards the end in a way that's usable by everybody. If this is a way that we can reframe what we're currently doing today, there will be huge impacts, positive impacts in terms of the built environment. 
So without having to look at trends, without having to look at um, the way that the world is changing because of the pandemic um, and so on, just by changing our own behavior and uh, value proposition, we will have a much larger impact um, moving forward because the data, um, as Khaled Cal mentioned, it is rising. There's more and more data available to us every day. There's private data that uh, sometimes isn't standardized and that's something we can get better at um, uh, leveraging the data that's available to us in a way that others are able to um, work with. Now you can actually affect us as building designers in a completely different way. Imagine working within a dashboard environment where instead of designing uh, independently and then um, having a meeting with the client and creating uh, data visualizations based on your outcomes, what if you, those data visualizations actually just popped up right in your um, visual field within the dashboard of your laptop or computer that you're working on or even phone. So in other words, if you made your building taller or you pinched it at the bottom, you would actually see the impacts immediately. And what happens here is we all know that data can inform what we do as designers, but what happens as you work in this environment, it actually improves your intuition. So it doesn't just inform your design, it improves your intuition. You actually become a better designer because you know now when you make something taller or you pinch it, what the effects will be in terms of cost, the unit mix, um, the impact on the code or the zoning and so on. These are things that you just pick up along the way. So this immediate feedback loop has is, is become only in the last five years, something that's incredibly important. Now, about six years ago, I attended a lecture uh, the lecture uh, was with Arup in Los Angeles, and they were working with a small company that was a um, spin-off of Google called Flux. Uh, Flux went defunct within uh, 18 months or a year and a half after um, that lecture. Um, but for a very brief time, looking at Austin, Texas, USA, they were looking at the possibility of designing buildings uh, in an automated way. So Keller again brought up the idea of automation. So what if these apps or these tools without using human beings could actually design whole cities for us. Um, the argument that Flux used was that in the coming just next 25 years or so, there are literally going to be billions of people who need affordable housing. And even if every architect on this planet started designing uh, housing today, we would not be able to quickly enough do it ourselves. We need to leverage technology to handle um, the population growth. And again, population growth is one along with climate change and uh, pandemic. And when I am saying uh, the rise of AI, um, it, it, it is one of the four um, population rises, you know, whether it's through migration or the movement of populations or just literally the growth of our communities, um, places where we live. Um, it is a very major concern. And so we need to leverage the technology. Now in 2017, um, usually when I'm not publicly speaking or teaching, I'm on Twitter or on social media. Um, and I was tweeting an idea and I was just pretending. I was saying, what if now that things are basically in real time, um, what if instead of doing a post occupancy evaluation a year after your building is completed, you did it digitally. In other words, leverage that data you have early on and then come up with the three-dimensional model and then look at the consequences on the world and the people using the building all digitally in a fraction of a second and have that prediction into the future inform the design you're about to do. I got all that within 144 characters in a tweet. And within moments, a professor in um, Milan, Italy at that time in Brescia, um, where I eventually met him, um, and in Florence, um, he tweeted, that's exactly what we're meeting on Milan right now to discuss. And so I've been back to Italy three times since 2017 to work with this professor and others to try to advance ideas just like this. So it's amazing from a social standpoint, in an in interpersonal intelligence standpoint, sometimes we sh share crazy ideas that we have on social media and they're not so crazy, you find out when you share them with others. Everyone has seen this, this is an example of what Kyla was talking about with, uh, with WeWork, or in this case, Autodesk, laying out their offices. What I wanna talk about here in uh, some of the next uh, upcoming slides is this idea that um, 
we have this idea that we're, we're going to leverage technology, in this case, a generative tool, which is a form of AI, to uh, optimize the space that we have available to us. All we need to do, you can see the little spider web on the upper left, and you can pick any six criteria that you want, and we can optimize for it. I say that this idea of optimization is actually very misleading. So we need to look at optimizing versus compromising. Now, nobody will get excited by compromising. I would need to hire an advertising firm to try to sell that as an idea um, that would be appealing to the masses. Optimization is something definitely that uh, people would pick given these two options. But I'm here to tell you we can't really optimize optimized based on what, um, what is available to us. So in other words, when you put down six criteria, any six criteria, two inevitably are gonna contradict each other. Look at the bottom left here. I'm freezing that, um, that uh, GIF. Uh, GIF. Um, low distraction and interconnectivity. You cannot get high marks for both of those because they both cancel out each other. It's one or the other. The other, so compromise is going to be very important to us as designers. It always has been, and it will continue to be, even when the tools themselves want to optimize the spaces for us. Another C, in addition to compromise, is common sense, along with critical thinking. So the tools, they don't care that they, there are structural um, columns that are landing in the conference room tables, for example, in these diagrams. Um, I don't know about you, I mean, that's one way to socially distance from others in your office is actually put a structural column between you. Um, but, you know, we've run out of criteria. I forgot to put down the seventh criteria, which is I don't like to have structural columns coming down in my conference room tables, for example. The world is lacking in common sense. Um, I can say this as an American just with these snapshots of New York in progress. Um, we just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should do something. And when we talk about impacting or, or building the future environment um, or the future of the environment, built environment, um, projecting the, what we're doing today into the future is not a very um, commonsensical way of looking at impacting the built environment. If we looked at everything from an AI or generative tool standpoint, if you, um, you know, famously, Louis Kahn asked a brick what it wanted to be, but if you asked every open web trust, steel trust, structural trust member, like a beam, um, what it wanted to be based on its particular lows and circumstance, something like this may come up. But if you ask, if, if you actually look at real buildings, this trust has always been okay. It's, it's, yes, it's been over-designed in some circumstances. Maybe it's in a warehouse and it's holding up, um, you know, storing pianos and, it, and that's what it was designed for. And then the pianos move out and they store feathers it's yes, it's overkill and maybe it's too much, but this, this structural member is doing just fine. Similarly, when we ask generative tools from an aesthetic standpoint to take a steel structural coupling and then morph it, inevitably it ends up turning into some kind of artwork that we can't necessarily relate to. We've developed our sense of art. So Khaled raised the question of AI and art and design. Um, we've developed our sense of design over millennia. And we're not going to be able to change as human beings in a relatively short period of time to accept the fact that even if maybe the second uh, to last image, maybe not the bust by Costco at the far right, but the second last image um, that may use half the steel or material and maybe even the space as the coupling on the left. Um, but on the other hand, it may not be one that we're willing to look at every day and live with and understand. Similarly, again, just very quickly looking at some tweets. Um, the way we build today is very much our model buildings is like the left, but when you actually let uh, machine learning um, apps um, uh, model or optimize in terms of walking time and distance and uh, distance to fire escapes in terms of safety, you end up with buildings like the ones on the right. And the problem is, of course, is that we're all going to become we're much better at bending materials in order to accommodate something like that. And that's not going to happen anytime soon. So again, common sense, critical thinking, and compromise, again, needs an ad campaign. These are very difficult to try to sell. It's hard for me to get my students excited about these things, but there's a lot of promise in them. In, when you leverage materials in a way that forgetting about aesthetics, but just in terms of reducing the amount of material and saving the planet, it can work. And when you just look at Amazon's ability to store twice as much 
um, as the typical storage units that are alphabetized or by category. Um, so Amazon, again, has a very chaotic and seemingly random approach, but the robots and human beings who leverage them are actually able to uh, work with twice as much in half as much area. Or even road intersections that are designed without traffic lights that have much fewer, if any, accidents um, are a vast improvement over what we go with. So again, critical thinking is about reducing the biases we currently have and asking lots of smart questions. Common sense is asking what kind of world you want to live in um, and where are people's preferences as opposed to um, what is the shiniest object that we should be going after. Um, in terms of AI, um, it is fascinating to look at shiny objects. Uh, this is from Stanislas Chalou, uh, a recent graduate of Harvard GSD, who now works for Spacemaker AI in Sweden. Um, and just looking at units that can be designed in fractions of a second. Now, just 20 years ago, I, I was a designer in Chicago of high rises. And I'd spend months every year working out the design of build out of units um, for these high rises that people would um, ultimately live in. But the unit designs that we'd work out were just for building permits. So in other words, they had to meet distance to fire stairs. Um, they had to meet air, you know, air and light requirements for daylighting and so on. And nobody would ever move into those units because they were too generic. Everyone who bought a unit would then hire an architect and build it out the way they'd like to have it. So I would love to have those three or four months every year of my life back from those days back now because AI can do all of that in a fraction of a second. It's not gonna take anyone's job away. What it does is it frees us up as building designers, as design professionals, as engineers, and even contractors to leverage our core competency, what we went into this field and industry and profession to work in our teams in firms for, as opposed to all that busy work designing units uh, that nobody would ever move into. Going back to Autodesk very quickly, so we move beyond designing individual units or buildings to whole neighborhoods. And as you can imagine, just by picking from the spider web you see on the bottom right, in this case, seven different criteria, I will freeze on one, which is this one. It's, again, it's missing the common sense of if you got up in the morning, you were a neighbor of this development and you walked down the road with your dog, maybe you don't want to look at garage doors all day long. Maybe this is optimized in terms of making profit for the building developer, um, but it is not optimizing in terms of lifestyle or enjoyability um, or people's preferences. Um, other tools like TestFit, I think are very fascinating. This one in particular right here, um, models are becoming increasingly smart and agile. So as the unit changes, as you physically engage with the model, so the model isn't taking over, you can exponentially smooth it, you can shrink it using your cursor, the unit uh, mix changes, and therefore some units that doesn't need as much parking has an impact on the parking garage. As the parking garage gets smaller, it needs fewer exit stairs because the building code is built into it. It knows all of this. So we were able to do this because instead of designing in a linear way, we have an inter, inter, you know, immediate feedback loop today. Now, when engineers design, all of us, when we design, we go from not knowing, knowing. When engineers do it, they do it in a very direct way. When designers and architects do it, we put up an impediment in the middle because design, of course, is an iterative pro process. And so it's hopefully not spinning around in circles. It's a spiral leading towards a solution. But that circle you see at the middle, the spiral, is the idea, the big idea. So we go from not knowing through a big idea to knowing, and that's how we work. But what we all need to do as design professionals is move away from the old idea of what it meant to be an architect. The world to come of design is going to involve one of three things. Either no one gets to design, as in the case of Flux on the far left, or everyone will design in the case of crowdsourcing designs, or what we used to call in the 1960s and 70s, uh, participatory design, or what you see in the middle, which I'm saying is the option that we're going to end up with, which is augmenting ourselves, where we all get to design something and someone gets to work on the design. The other two are forms of generative designing, including crowdsourcing. Instead of the computer generating the design, it's people generating design. But this is, we need to augment ourselves with technology. So here's a real quick instance of that. 
Maya Lin designed a waveform, a natural landscape through her intuition in the art sense, um, a couple of them in the United States. Snowheda, on the other hand, designed a waveform using computational tools. In the Max 4 laboratory building, it was built very close to a highway. The vibrations from the highway meant that the lab, um, uh, lab testing couldn't really work. The vibrations were too loud. So Snowheda could have built a wall along the highway to stop the sound, but what they did is they used computational tools to design a computational landscape in the form of a waveform that bounced the sound from the highway back. It also allowed for um, water in, um, to collect, uh, meadowlands and stormwater capture, but also public space for people to enjoy. But best of all is this, which I think most of you know, in using computational tools, they can actually feed it into the um, uh, machinery, the bulldozers that then carved the land. So it's like 3D printing the landscape right from the same tool that they use to design the landscape. So BIM very quickly, using some of the ideas uh, that I came, uh, came up with in uh, my Convergence book in 2017, BIM is this isolated thing. In terms, this is a uh, heat map based on research that has been done over the years that BIM doesn't really play very well with all the other forms of research. It's very isolated. People who do BIM, BIM managers and BIM coordinators tend to work in isolation from others in teams. What we need to do more is uh, have in the age of Venn, much more like Venn diagrams where we interact with virtual reality, for example, that we do with Revisto and other tools or the internet of things or um, geo design and GIS. So this is from 2006, a building that's right by the architecture school where I teach in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois at the University of Illinois. And this is the BIF building or the building um, facility that's being built. And the part that you see in green is when you hold your BIM model up on your smartphone to, I think it's 2007, to the site, the part that's in green is ahead of schedule or on schedule and the part that's in red is behind schedule. And today, this is just from two weeks ago, AI can actually scan buildings now and identify the parts of projects without BIM models um, that are behind schedule. These Venn diagrams become more and more complex, leveraging photogrammetry, for example, and point clouds. So it can identify people who are out on a construction site just using random video or photographs, but also equipment that's out there. And then it grabs the, um, from computer vision, uh, grabs those photos and video and transcribes them into schedules and identifies where there's idle time. So as you, you well know, in over 60 years, the, uh, the architecture, engineering, construction field of all the fields or industries has not increased at all in terms of productivity. Here is a fantastic way to leverage technology and people to create more productivity. The Venn diagram becomes five-pointed, as in the case in Partisan Partners in Toronto, Canada, an architecture firm that leverages computational tools to run the robots that actually produce Bar, Ravel in this case, or this wonderful sauna, does all the woodwork. So purpose-built BIMs then become more and more, if not complex, multifaceted and agile, and they're able to actually do many, many more things for us until we create a whole gestalt or a whole environment of these Venn diagrams that we can just pick from. Think of it as a toolkit of different ways that you can approach projects by morphing different tools together. This leads me very quickly to some of the takeaways from my 2019 book from last year, Super Users. Super Users are people who have the wherewithal to recognize a tool when they see one. They have the curiosity to inquire or ask about a tool. They have the confidence to take a tool home after work or after school and mess around with it. They always have capacity to learn a new tool. Even the most busy people are the ones with the most capacity. They always find a way to create room. They have the innovation sense or creativity to combine tools, as you just saw a moment ago with those Venn diagrams. But most important of all, they have the interpersonal intelligence to connect with others who are also um, interested and experts in different things. We can't possibly know everything ourselves. And so having a network of people we can reach out to, whether they're online or they're in person, makes all the difference. In the book, Super Users, I spell out 10 different attributes. I'm not gonna dwell on them here. They all start with the letter C, but the big takeaway from this is nine of them are soft skills, mindsets, or attitudes. Only one, the last one, actually has anything to do with um, 
with uh, technology. Even the second last one, computational thinker, is just somebody who wakes up in the morning, goes to work or goes to school and says, huh, I just did something for the third time today. I wonder if I could automate it and make it go faster. It's, not, it's less about technology and more and less about automation than just the ability to recognize when you do a repetitive, uh, repetitive behavior and therefore maybe can ask someone in the firm to come up with a way to make it happen or go faster. Super users are firefighters and fixers who work to, um, the work that they do is, yeah, it's definitely for pay, but um, they consider the work they do is noble. Super users always provide value to others. They redefine any assignment they're given in terms of financial performative, liability reducing, and architectural design excellence, increasing value. Super users are talent accelerants. Everyone that you work with as a super user or who works with a super user is better at what they do. They're force multipliers. Just working with a few people, they're able to do a lot more work. As you see here, um, a super user is able to actually accomplish 80% of the work with 20% of the time and energy. Super users work in that wonderful gray space that every employer is aware of, but most employees are not aware of, which is you want to be partly a generalist and partly a specialist. And that sweet spot between them is the gray space where a super user resides. So if you had to actually come up with a calculation, it would be EQ or emotional intelligence over, not Dairy Queen, but uh, digital quotient. So again, a super user is somebody when you need to tackle a problem, knows the difference between buying a tool, outsourcing it, whether they should hire someone to do it, or just create the tool themselves. A lot of architecture and engineering firms are becoming software companies because they're coming up with their own tools. Super users are also T-shaped individuals where you have some strength, whatever that strength or specialization happens to be. But then your horizontal wingspan is the social element that allows you or enables you to connect with others. So becoming a T-shaped individual is a very important thing. If this is what your desk looks like right now, then you're a manager. If this is what it looks like, then you're a super user. The important thing in terms of data for super users is we're gonna be using sensors a lot more and spreadsheets a lot yet less. And that's why our desks are looking more and more like this. So very quickly, I'm not gonna dwell on this slide, but you'll have access to this because it's being recorded right now. Um, it's this idea that super users are growing out of the Gen Z generation. That's the current cohort of students and recent graduates or emerging professionals out in the field now they have a very different view of how they see themselves and see the roles that they play. It's not a cliche, it's not a demographic where you can put people into a little box. Nobody likes to be labeled that way. Um, but Gen Zs, importantly, see themselves as being very expansive. They see themselves as working hard and paying their dues, but also becoming um, more productive and working smarter, not longer. Now I'd like to close up very quickly with my recent research in AI. Um, which has not made huge advances. We, you know, we point to a lot of things like generative tools and call it AI. And so here I'd like to actually, as a good academic, start with a definition, just so we all know what we're talking about just for the last two or three minutes of this talk. So it could involve a rover or a small robot on a construction site that has a video attached to it that either takes pictures or videos and identifies the stages of work that um, have taken place or if there's anything that's a concern in terms of safety. It could point to certain parts of the project and say there are voids or things that, that are missing because through AI and machine learning, it gets smarter and smarter, recognizing these patterns. Those same robots could be drones taking pictures of older buildings, let's say a university campus, um, where a lot of the materials are de uh, deteriorating and th they are, they're able to identify where, where repairs need to take place. As you saw before, we're able to merge our 3D models with the real construction side by side or on top of each other so they can inform each other in terms of time and uh, quality. So I'm not gonna dwell on any of these right here, but I want to end by saying that um, I've been uh, graced uh, with being a recipient in the last month um, of two major grants, working with a great team at my university, University of Illinois, but also Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh in the United States um, to establish uh, the first of its kind National Institute for Artificial Intelligence in construction. And just to be clear by construction, what we mean is really a very expansive way of looking at that, the design, the construction operations of buildings and infrastructure. Um, and um, 
It is going to start soon in the planning stage. We're working with 40 or more architecture engineering firms and startups to arrive at a collective vision for how AI can be leveraged in our industry. Again, not using our biases. Maybe we come up with apps or tools. We end up saying that's the way things should go. This is a better way. It's a more crowdsourced. It's more social, social way. It's a way to use our network to actually come up with what is really needed. Um, and then how can we best go about doing it? in this institute. We have intractable um, problems, as we talked about, wicked problems that don't have obvious solutions. They're non-obvious um, uh, problems that we all need to find ways to solve. And the only way we can do that is by leveraging um, the talents and insights and abilities of each other. And we need to work on multidisciplinary, but also on very diverse teams, because people come from different walks of life, People who have different backgrounds and points of view will help us to tackle these problems. The ultimate goal for this institute is to engage um, these methods and tools working towards an entrepreneurial or startup model where we can actually take some of the solutions to the market. That's a nuance actually in some ways for a university. And finally, I just wanna say my own personal role is twofold. It's in terms of being in charge of the generative design that we talked about a little bit in this talk, but also important, really importantly, is, are the ethics. There's no one else on the team who really addresses ethics. And I've been teaching it for over 20 years in professional practice. It's this idea that you and I not only represent our own ideas and the client's ideas, but the building users and the neighbors and the public at large and generations that don't even exist or haven't been born yet. Um, we need to represent all of them. So all the decisions that are made um, every AI has a bias or every um, algorithm has a bias or more built into it. We need to be aware of what those are. So we're not working with black boxes and worse where we become black boxes ourselves. We need to overcome all of that. And this Institute will be a starting place for us as an industry to enable that to happen. So I'd like to close with something from AEC magazine that said in the next five years um, will be a crucial time for the development of AI in our industry. It's going to end up in the next five years. This is a prediction in most applications. It's gonna be on demand through cloud services. Um, it's going to be watching our project management and also our construction sites, as you saw with the Rover and other robots. Um, and it's going to be deployed from concept through the project life cycle and back through design all over again. So it is here, it's here to stay. Um, unlike the pandemic, which will come and go, but there always will be pandemics. Um, technology is going to take off very soon. In response to that, my final slide is, again, writing books during the pandemic. I wrote two 300-page books. One came out this week called Think Like an Architect, helping us address the rise of AI to distinguish ourselves and working with these tools, but also what we can do better than the tools. And in a book that's coming out early in 2021, uh, Adapt as an Architect, which will help us redefine ourselves throughout our careers so we have long, rewarding, and productive careers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Randy, for the set of very interesting um, trends that is coming up, which is related a lot to the, to us, the technology and automations. And uh, we are definitely looking forward to reading your books. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, um, next, we'll move on to George. Um, yeah, we'll move on to George, um, the Southwest uh, Regional Virtual Design and Construction Leader at DPR. Uh, George, please. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'm honored to be with you all today. Thank you for having me today. Forgive me for getting set up here. Um, my name is Josh DiStefano. Uh, as Ian mentioned, I work for DPR Construction. I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about how we are digitizing the built environment. Um, so let's jump into it. So kind of a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about today. So I want to do a little bit of an introduction, talk to you guys about who we are, what we do, specifically what I do in my role as a VDC manager and my uh, work in field technology. I'm going to talk a lot about DPRs, digital transformation. I believe that uh, DPR is a company that's embodying a lot of the uh, concepts that uh, Kaylee and uh, Randy discussed today. And I've uh, got some great examples of that. And part of that is how we uh, combine people, process, technology, and metrics 
um, and how we look at all those things to bring them together to deploy technology um, and ensure that we're getting the uh, engagement and ultimately the results that we're looking for. And I'll also talk about uh, the pandemic. There's obviously been a lot of that uh, topic today. And I can talk a little bit uh, to kind of the boots on the ground. How did it affect us? How did it affect our team? How did construction change for, for us, um, primarily as a US-based contractor? And then I've got some thoughts as well, uh, similar trends, similar uh, you know, ideas that uh, uh, these two other thought leaders have, have come up with today. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm gonna talk about who we are and what we do. Um, so I work for DPR Construction and what we like to say is that we exist to build great things. And we specifically uh, leave that open. It's purposely not limited to buildings or busy building physical things um, because it includes building our, our communities. It includes building relationships. It includes building teams and, and, and ultimately building our reputation as, as a builder. And, and part of that is operating with these core values of integrity, doing what we say we're gonna do, um, you know, building sustainably, building safely, things like that. Um, enjoyment, we want people to enjoy the work that they do, come to work being, you know, feeling fulfilled, feel like they are uh, contributing to something larger than themselves. Uh, uniqueness, we pride ourselves on being different. Uh, I like to say that being different is better than being better. Um, and and that's kind of sums it up right there that you really stand out if you're unique. And ever forward is kind of the idea of advancing uh, and continuous improvement um, for you know the sake of improving and 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 doing things better. And um, I would say that that's probably uh, my favorite as as sort of a, a, a technologist. So where are we? We're we're located uh, everywhere. Um, I'm at the little orange dot here in Southern California. Uh, talking to you guys today from uh, Huntington Beach, uh, next door to where my office usually is in, in Newport Beach. Um, but we have offices around the globe and we do projects primarily in the US, uh, Europe, and uh, a few in Asia here and there. And then we do have uh, support resources around the globe as well, including a large team uh, in India that supplements uh, several of our um, processes. We are the 12th largest contractor in the U.S. as of uh, you know, our 2020. Uh, last year, we were the 10th. Um, but getting into the type of projects we build, uh, you'll see uh, I've got a, plenty of project examples where I'll talk about you know, what, what we're doing with technology. And you'll see that these projects are primarily in these core markets. And they are advanced technology, healthcare, higher education, life sciences, and commercial um, facilities. And there's a reason for this. These are, um, you know, an area, areas that we can specialize in. Um, they're areas that we uh, like to work because we are a highly technical builder. We like to uh, do challenging projects for uh, clients that have, uh, you know, very, you um, uh, technologically advanced facilities. Um, and we also like the impact that these facilities make when, when you know that you contributed to uh, building a hospital or, you know, providing, uh, you know, a data center for, you know, a tool to work better or something like that. Um, it's really nice to know, you know, to point to something that's impacting our communities and say, yeah, it was part of that. So we stick usually within these uh, core markets to, uh, leverage our strengths uh, and and um, deploy technology uh, where it provides a lot of value. So a little bit more about uh, me. I'm Josh DeStefano. I've been in the AEC industry for, uh, gosh, almost 20 years now. My uh, current role is the Southwest VDC Director at DPR Construction, and I also lead our field technology initiatives uh, across the nation. And I'll talk a little bit more about what all that is. 
Um, I'm also the vice president of the US IBD, which is the US Institute of Building Documentation. And this is a small organization that is uh, doing market research on how buildings are documented and aims to uh, provide that research to benefit the, uh, the larger industry. It also creates standards and is working on getting those standards adopted within the industry, specifically a, a level of accuracy standard that goes through uh, similar to how the AIA's level of detail describes a model. Uh, it goes through uh, and describes the accuracy between the data that you collect about a existing facility um, and, and how much you can rely on that to be uh, within you know, specific tolerance. Um, at, in my work, I'm a builder, uh, innovator, uh, technologist. In some circles, I've been called a, a thought leader, uh, definitely not as forward thinking as, as, our, uh, as my co-host today, but uh, you know, in, in the construction world, uh, definitely considered an innovator. I also do word working on the side, but uh, when I'm not at work, I'm, I'm a father of three, a husband, um, and lately my hobby has been uh, surfing uh, and additionally some, some woodworking, like I mentioned. So I wanted to talk about a couple things uh, when I'm talking about what we, what we do as a construction company or an innovative construction company. I wanted to talk about these two strategies. So this is connected to DPR's mission to be most admired. And specifically, you know, we have other strategies. There's very, you know, a lot of them, but we have a couple different focuses that I wanted to uh, pinpoint today, which are virtual design and construction uh, and, and data. And the reason I bring up uh, data is because there's a couple different ways to to look at data there's there's the data that we collect with our reality capture um laser scanning and and, and some of the the technology there that digitizes the, the real world um and then there's also um the data as as a company our business data um and 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 both of those uh have have a place in in this particular presentation so Essentially what we're trying to do um, is make these things uh, part of just the way we do business. So we've, we've, I've been at DPR for over eight years and I've essentially always done virtual design and construction, but we've definitely shifted and gone to a focus of creating and managing our, our 3D data as, as a whole, creating some consistency. Um, and probably more important is, is integrating our 3D workflows. And part of that is teaching people uh, to how to leverage the technology. So we wanna make sure that people know how to use the information. It's not just about a specialized group. Uh, Randy talked about the specialists and the generalists. Uh, we have a mix of, of people that, that, that work on our virtual design and construction workflows. Uh, and we encourage our project teams to be part of that uh, and, and uh, even, uh, push that to some degree. And I mentioned data, the primary outcomes of that are, are, are outcomes that we're looking for are to create consistency, to get the right data at the right time so that we can help uh, improve our decision making. So a little bit on virtual design and construction at DPR. What, is, what, are, what are some of the things that we're doing now or, or optimizing? Um, you know, Randy talked about shifting the, the value proposition. Uh, when we talk about VDC and virtual design and construction, we talk about it touching all parts of the, the project life cycle. We see benefits in, in, in enabling prefabrication by having better plans. We say Im improvements in design where we can, uh, you know, validate what's there and, and, and coordinate a design with, with more information and be more informed. We can enable um, better productivity because we know what we're building. We're getting from that, you know, uh, unknowing to knowing, as, as Randy mentioned. We can simulate and we can optimize the schedule. Uh, we can use different things for quality, whether it's just understanding what we're building better and how the parts and pieces come together, uh, or actually collecting data in the field and, and using that data to do some analysis. 
and obviously a lot of these things uh, you know contribute to the whole life cycle cost but they also support them for fm um, which is essentially you know the, the the concept of a digital twin so you know what's an example of of implementation so you know wanted to talk about deploying multiple use cases on on one project um, this in particular is is one project where um, you know trying to take all that value proposition and, and and show what are the things that we implemented on this job and i've got several examples to to go through um, on other projects to just kind of give you an idea of what visual planning is for example um, where we would leverage the model to go through the sequence of the project and do some of that simulation um, with future things being the aug augmenting through AI and we, we've experimented with some of that. We can talk a little bit about you know how those things uh, how we're optimizing our our model-based uh, coordination and leveraging dashboards and data and sort of elevating something that has been really the cornerstone of, of BIM and VDC for a long time, and now we're getting better at it. We're getting more consistent with the data that we lever we, we tack on to our models um, that are allowing us to track progress much better than we have before uh, and understand and communicate what's happening with a process that was, you know, hard to understand uh, because it was, you know, largely uh, Untrans not transparent. Randy talked about BIM being sort of in its own bubble, and that's very, very true. What we're trying to do is is get out of that bubble and to you know cross uh, functionally collaborate a lot more. Um, I'm also going to talk a lot about field technology, which is the green one on the on the left, where we are leveraging advanced field technology to do. Um, pre-pour scanning to understand what's happening with concrete um, before we pour so that we can make sure that we have everything uh, where it needs to be, but with precise uh, data. We're also looking at using similar technology for analyzing floor flatness and floor levelness. This becomes important going back to our core markets. A lot of those projects have sensitive equipment. They have racks. They have different things that surprisingly enough and and not mainstream to most people <laughs> um floor flatness and the quality of concrete uh makes a big difference um with those things we have uh, a lot of times we'll be installing medical imaging equipment that requires uh, a very precise very flat floor um it just due to the the, the way that the equipment uh, senses and, and moves around. If you're starting with a flat floor, you're in a lot better shape. Uh, additionally, we're using things like aerial site mapping and, and 360 photos, and I'll talk a little bit about that as, as well. And we're also a self-performing general contractor, so we do a lot of um, self-perform work, and that's primarily because we can uh, you know, control quality, we can provide a better quality product, we can plan out the work in, to, in more details, and we have um, the ability to uh, control more of the schedule and ensure that things are, are on track if we have one of the critical trades under our belt. So Randy talked a lot about people, um, and a, a lot of my job is trying to connect um, people and, and process. So one of the things that we're trying to do, and I haven't got into the examples, but is take these examples, these pockets of excellence, if you will, um, and scale them. Take, take a pocket of excellence and, and we are working on also at the same time enabling our workforce. So I mentioned that we are you know, training our, our, our people to leverage the data. Uh, a lot of the, the tools are great, but um, the way that I talk about VDC is, is, is the way that a lot of uh, folks talk about safety and that safety is everybody's responsibility. And we're sort of moving toward that where virtual design and construction, good planning, visual planning, um, you know, leveraging the model, thinking about the, the data that's available and, and how to use it to improve your process um, is all part of that. So we are, you know, growing our teams, we're growing our abilities. 
um, through dedicated resources, but we're also working on grabbing those pockets of excellence, turning them into training and best practices so that we can instill all of that great knowledge uh, into our you know, workforce and, and create folks that have more exposure into those areas so that ultimately we have a VDC enabled workforce, we have a support team, um, but we are, you know, essentially creating uh, that similar, you know, feedback loop or, or continuous feedback loop that, that Randy talked about um, and, and, and discussed. So now I want to talk a little bit about um, actually getting into some of our examples. So we, one of the things that we look at when we talk about virtual design and construction is, is coordinating the design. Um, some of the ways that we're pulling together, you know, frameworks, people process technology and, and metrics or data is through a better transparency with our, our coordination. So just to recap coordination or, or design coordination is essentially, um, you know, for, for us as a general contractor, we're typically, uh, I don't want to say stuck, but, you know, in a sense in between the design and, and the building um, or actually we're building and my role is kind of stuck in between, right? Being working for a builder uh, as a technologist. So what I end up, I and my team end up doing is a, a lot of our work is pulling those designs together, pulling the guys that are gonna build it. And just like Randy talked about, think like an architect, um, we are having the same con kind of conversations where we are getting folks to think like an architect or, or think like a detailer. And we're sort of trying to get folks to understand the, their perspective because this process is right in the middle of it. Um, so we are working to make more transparency, leverage our data, put better data into the models that add to our coordination process, give us that transparency so that we can have better communication and better transparency, but also get folks to understand the perspective of the engineer, the perspective of um, who we call the detailer, which is the trade partner, um, the guy who's actually creating the model that will be the uh, in preparation for building out in the field. So we're leveraging all this to get people to um, uh, connect with the process and then ultimately, you know, connect with themselves, uh, people to people. In addition, we're leveraging uh, models to do advanced uh, visual planning. Uh, there's several, uh, I, I say advanced, there's a spectrum. Um, it kind of depends on what we're, what we're looking at, but sometimes it's, you know, sequencing out an, in, uh, an entire building. Sometimes it's detailing out an entire, uh, just one floor uh, and looking at the individual uh, activities, say, you know, in this case, we're looking at the different activities. And then in another case, we might be looking at the, the, the sequence of the building uh, from start to finish. Um, and these things allow the, the team to have that transparency, to, to make things visual, to know exactly where we are uh, at any given time. We're also leveraging that model um, to do quantity takeoffs and, 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 and change analysis. That was one of the things that we mentioned. Something that's been a, a buzzword the last few years has been prefabrication. Um, all this digital construction uh, really lends itself to planning things out in, in the digital space and then building them in a controlled environment. So we've uh, invested not only in um, uh, creating companies to create those those uh, components uh, and build those prefabricated components. We're also investing in our modeling and our libraries to plan and and influence the design through uh, having models and being able to simulate where those things are going to go, um, and then subsequently using field technology uh, to ensure that they're going to fit. We're also using models for uh, 3D production tracking and quality control where we're publishing the model, managing, and then again, leveraging data to, to share and have that visual um, for, the, for the team to see uh, and track. But really where uh, I get passionate these days is, is, is talking about field technology. And this is really where we get into digitizing 
um, the built environment. And I've sort of walked you guys through, uh, <laughs> in a sense, the last uh, six years of my career or so from focusing on virtual design and construction and how we leverage the models to really getting into how field technology and how we digitize the real world and bring it into the virtual world for the sake of um, additional uh, analysis and leveraging AI and all this stuff is extremely fascinating to me. So um, I've, I've had the pleasure of, of uh, being able to develop some of the strategy and leading some of our initiatives for how we develop uh, frameworks, for how we deploy uh, laser scanning, our building controls, aerial mapping, mapping and, and dig what I'm calling data mobility. And so essentially laser scanners, um, if you haven't heard about them before, taking millions of measurements, uh, sort of like a 3D uh, scan, but very precise one. Uh, and just like Randy talked about, we've never been able to do some of the things that we can do today. Laser scanning is a great example that uh, we can digitize entire space uh, an entire job site in a very short amount of time and do, then do a lot of different things with that because we have such accurate information. We also have uh, aerial mapping. You know, that's the idea of using drones to create pictures and, you know, provide photogrammetry so that we can do uh, site analysis and, and, and comparisons to uh, the model, which is the, the plan uh, and, and things like that. Also site monitoring, we do uh, time lapse and all kinds of different stuff like that. Um, and then building and, and, and data mobility are, are, are kind of similar in the sense of this is now where we get into transferring information. So the building control um, is, is where we're taking digital information and we're transferring that to the real world with uh, survey, building controls, secondary controls, and essentially saying, where is that gonna be in, in real space uh, using surveying type equipment? And the data mobility is getting that information out to the field. And, and probably for us is, is the least mature, although there's a lot of different tools, um, but our, our, our strategy is, is getting there. So I wanna talk a little bit about, you know, what, so how does this all come together? You know, especially the uh, building controls and, and the laser scanning and, and, and some of the uh, reality capture. So when we look at, virtual design and construction, it's sort of these two middle things where we wanna model what we build and, and build what we model. Um, and using a baseball analogy, we're talking about sort of being on deck and, and being at the plate. Uh, and, and when we're modeling, we're, we're sort of developing a plan, we're clarifying the scope and budget, we're coordinating and optimizing the design. Essentially, we're planning the work. So uh, Randy discussed, looking at the building as a database. It's very much, you know, a, a similar idea here. Um, and then we want to act on that database, right? We want to build what we model. So this is when we're executing, when we're out at the plate, uh, to use the baseball analogy, and where we're leveraging model-based layout and installation. We're optimizing for, for prefab and, and, and modular construction. Um, and essentially, we've worked the plan. So we're building what we modeled. Now, field technology sort of bookends these two things, these two concepts, but it also fits in between them all because when we are validating um, and, and ideally, you know, warming up, if you will, then we want to validate the existing conditions and we can use reality capture, laser scanning, 360 photos, uh, matter ports, aerial mapping, all these things to validate the existing conditions and ultimately eliminate surprises. And that to me is informing the plan. Um, but to know where that data is in space, we need survey and building controls, hence a little icon uh, to the left there. And then bringing it all home when we're crossing the plate, scoring, coming to the finish line kind of thing, we want to verify what we built. And, and we want to collect data as we go so that we can control quality, eliminate errors, and manage the risk. And again, there's survey and building control in between all these because that's what is the connection between the digital and the, and the real uh, world. We're, we're, whenever we're grabbing information, we want to say where it is in real space. Uh, and whenever we're putting out information, we need to make sure that we're putting it in the right place. So survey and building control uh, is where that connection comes in. Hence, it's called control. 
so that's kind of getting to a you know data driven strategy and I wanted to give um, a few examples of what we're doing here and this just kind of brings this stuff into context where we're digitizing and, and combining uh, models and, and point clouds and really this is just sort of a fly through to give you guys context on what these things look like this isn't a complicated space there's not a whole lot into it but what you're seeing is the colorization is is a real uh, or what we call a point cloud rather um, and now it's switched over to a model that's based off of that uh, information and so what we've done here is we've digitized the real world brought it into a model environment created a model of the existing conditions and now we can take that and subsequently do uh, design and coordination and all these other things, having the constraints of the real world in the digital space. So that's a kind of a basic example of what a point cloud looks like, what we're getting out of our, some of our reality capture tools. And now I wanna go into some specific uh, examples of how we're uh, leveraging this technology. So within uh, concrete construction, I mentioned this earlier that we, uh, when we get into uh, self-performing concrete, a lot of times we will pre, uh, do scanning pre-pour. Essentially, that means I'm deploying a laser scanner out to a job site. Um, we have an example of this for a real estate headquarters that we did here in Southern California, here on the screen, um, where on the bottom right, you see this sea of, of uh, <laughs> not only utilities, electrical lines, but uh, uh, concrete reinforcing and essentially what we'll do there is we'll go and we'll we'll capture all that and you'll get a result similar to the top right screen where now we can take the information that we've digitized overlay it with the plan and start to understand are we actually building to plan um, and we can fix anything before it becomes uh you know solidified in concrete right <clears throat> So I wanted to shift a little bit um, now and talk about how these tools helped us respond um, to COVID. So, uh, you know, we were, we were already on this track of leveraging these, these tools and getting these out to it. And, and like a lot of uh, the discussion has been today, what I've seen is really just an acceleration of, of using these tools. So we already had sight cameras, you know, a lot of these things in place. I mentioned laser scanning, photogrammetry or, or, or site uh, mapping as well, the 360 cameras and the robotic total stations. And what happened through the pandemic was that we saw a, a, an increase in the need to document our, our projects. So we, we had projects where, you know, talking to this bullet point of our clients and their shift in priorities, some projects were delayed, some were accelerated, and we realized that we needed to uh, document the progress and, and, and understand where some of these jobs were so that we knew where things were going in the future and we could uh, basically, you know, sort of put a, a stake in the ground or a flag on the ground of where things were for jobs that were, you know, going um, to be uh, temporarily, you know, shut down kind of thing. So we ended up accelerating a lot of these and it, it also obviously provided a lot of different uh, challenges, you know, looking at, you know, how, how, how our projects, how are we going to keep people safe? Um, can we keep working? If we, if we do, how can we work within the guidelines? I mentioned the, the shift with our clients' uh, priorities and, you know, some jobs being delayed, some forced uh, shutdowns due to shelters in place and things like that. Uh, how do we ensure security on job sites, for example, document what's there, uh, and then move to, you know, if a job site was shut down, we need to make sure that we document what's there uh, for several reasons. Um, security is an issue. People see a job site broken down or uh, shut down and equipment, expensive tools, and sometimes there's theft, so we need to document um, the, the site conditions and the, and the project uh, for, for those reasons as well. And then how is it gonna affect our, our people? So, um, you know, there was mention of working in shifts or, or alternate schedules. 
you know, we, we had to look at our office capacity limits and do things like that where we had, you know, remote work uh, and, and again, accel accelerating our, our digital uh, workforce, if you will, or our digital transformation. So pulling these, this together, you know, how did, how did field technology and our response to COVID sort of, you know, start to blend together? We started doing more uh, virtual walkthroughs, more 360 photos. Um, we, we started really thinking about how the tools that we had could help us digitize what was there to, to help communicate it. And this included things like um, what you're seeing on the screen is, is, a, is a project in, in Asia where um, they're building uh, some, uh, well, not yet. <laughs> it's uh, just after demo, but they'll be building a, a life science facility in that space. So our, our ability to digitize the space through our field technology initiatives allows us to deploy these things for the, the use of remote inspections or progress risk documentation and, and um, understanding exactly where the, where the job is and where it's going. And then also helped us to simulate um, things. We were looking at models and CAD and, and how we could, you know, rearrange our job site in a similar way that uh, Randy was talking about using AI and generative design. And I wish we would have had some of these tools, but, um, you know, in this case, we're, we're not the, the designer here, but we're helping to sort of, like, like I said before, bridge the gap. Um, and this is an example of how our, our, our clients sort of pivot um, in, in the sense that we had a client that was working toward uh, building these modular emergency response units. And we were able to bring all these things together between our virtual design and construction, our field technology, um, and our design management and, and design coordination to help come up with several different um, examples and also um, help the team understand exactly how we would build these modular uh, response units. So how does they, going to our people, our projects, you know, how is this going, how has the pandemic uh, affected us? Uh, it's definitely changed the way that our, how our job sites look. Uh, you can see some areas we're using visual cue, cues to show folks, you know, just what social distancing looks like. Um, there's been, you know, a lot of uh, understanding and uh, in, in ways rather to uh, collect um, data and, and keep people safe. So one of the things we're doing that I don't have uh, a visual of is our, our screening stations on job sites. So just like with uh, every, a lot of places that we uh, have to go today, we're getting um, screened at our, at our job sites to ensure that, you know, uh, people are, are healthy when they, when they come to work. Uh, and, and the reason that I bring that up is that DPR was able to take that strategy of data and, and, technology development and pivot and, and take the developers that we had to not just do screening, but to create an app uh, and, and be able to use QR codes, get people through the process as, as fast as possible. So our, our views of technology and our, our, our uh, data strategy and, and the way that we build those things allowed us to be a lot, uh, a very, very nimble and, and, create tools to, to help us out um, and also to, you know, be innovative on the job site and keep our people safe. So now I want to get into the fun stuff to talk a little bit about, you know, what does what digitizing the built, built environment look beyond 2020? I think there's a lot of um, theming here and a lot of alignment with what Kaylee and uh, Randy talked about today with, you know, the concept of digital twin, um, the ideas of big, big data, I think there's going to be um, a push toward this concept of passive data capture, meaning that we're grabbing information from the field uh, without, uh, you know, having to uh, use labor, which is exactly what Randy was talking about with the uh, rovers and things like that. And having a lot of this data will 
allow us to do more simulation. Um, and just like Kaylee said, with the the uh, move toward people first and the flexibility, I couldn't agree with that more. And I have a few examples of these. Um, this is a, a, a video from from geospatial world uh, that sort of talks about uh, the concept of the digital twin and introduces it in a couple different contexts. But I think this this is arguably the the, the next big thing in in AEC. Um, but what I think is going to be a challenge here is 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 collecting all this data. So um, that's why I've gotten into the reality capture portion of it. I think clients are going to have a uh, a realization that there's a bridge to gap between these concepts and where they are now um, and start to change their processes to require us to capture that verification data of what we're building uh, so that they can leverage it in the future uh, as a digital twin for, for building uh, asset management. The next thing, uh, and I'm just about ready to close, is kind of combining this idea of reality capture and augmented reality. So this is a really fun uh, sort of experiment, if you will, where, uh, and, and, and the reason I say this is, this is tied to what I see in the future uh, is that what we're looking at here is we're, we're looking at a drone flight indoors, which doesn't sound all that crazy. Um, but as you see here with the flash there, it says uh, creates a 3D point cloud as it flies. Essentially, what we're looking at is a drone that has several sensors on it, similar to a self-driving car that can navigate itself through a building. And this is an example of passive data capture, as I mentioned, is one of the one of the trends. And I think this is just beginning to scratch the surface on, on what it can do. So right now it can navigate itself. It gives it, it itself a, a, a geos, like a buffer, if you will. Um, you can see that it won't, won't be able to fit through this opening because to the drone, it's six, seven feet big. It doesn't realize that it's only a small drone. It thinks it has a, a bubble around it. So it's only going to fit through certain openings. But what I think this does is it illustrates just kind of where we are now. And if you can extrapolate this into the future where, uh, you know, if we can get things like this flying safely through a construction site without hitting anything, you can see he's not even facing the drone. Um, so he's clearly not navigating it. Uh, and and it follows through through him through several areas of this uh, construction site. Although I think it gets stuck here, and he has to go around. Um, but you can see just how much stuff is there. And if you were you know flying a normal drone around, uh, that would be very difficult. So what we're what we're looking at again, like I said, is it's it's computer vision, but it's also AI leveraging um, AI to to navigate itself and. I see the conversion of this type of technology, this passive data capture, and some of the things that we've already talked about today with um, AI and, and analyzing the information that we, we capture. So we're already working with partners to understand how we can take data from this drone or data from 360 photos to uh, understand productivity uh, and track work in place and, and things like that. So I see a lot of those trends uh, for the future and um, looking forward to it. So uh, thank you, I appreciate your time and that's all I had. Yeah. Thank you so much, George, for your wonderful presentations. Uh, I think we are able to learn a lot more in regards to the how few technology advancement has become nowadays and also how could we be able to look at it in the situation of the current pandemics. Thanks so much, George. So next, what we are going to do is that we'll move on to the panel discussions. 
uh, at the moment for all your audience, if you would like to you wish to ask uh, other questions, feel, please feel free to put it over at your Q&A box. Okay, let's begin. Uh, we have seen uh, quite a good response. We have around like seven to eight questions that we have right now. So um, we have, um, due to some time constraint, we have actually saved up some of the good ones, uh, some of the more interesting ones that we would like to ask people. So let's begin. Um, maybe for this questions, um, it's targeted to maybe Randy and Josh for first. Uh, there are two very similar questions actually. Uh, first um, is by Mr. Lim Kim Chong. His question is, um, is AI solution already available to auto design structure, me mechanical and electrical design and drawings once architectural beam model is available and even AI can take, um, can, can take lead to do auto architecture design. At this moment, we are still facing challenges to talk among our all softwares and different um, of different disciplines using beam uh, we need to come quicker to catch the uh, development speed as other industry has gone faster than the industry. Uh, there's also another similar questions below as well, which is uh, um, to Josh, uh, what would you say is the biggest challenge for being to break up of this foreign uh, bubble? Maybe you start with that. Yeah, I can, I can start with the ah, no uh, BIM breaking out of its current bubble um yeah that's a, that's a good one and I, I really like that randy brought that up because i've sort of lived on the edge of that bubble trying to get both sides to uh sort of meet and i think that um you know that's that's a, a lot of it is uh that the technology has a way of of dividing people into the people that are really into the technology and the people that think that it's it's disconnected um and what I've seen is that it's really coming together, the, the people and the process and the technology, all that really needs to come together. And the big thing for me is getting folks to understand that the technology doesn't work without your involvement. Uh, it's, it's, it's useless. And, and uh, maybe it'll provide some value, but it really doesn't drive it to the finish line. And, and Randy's talked a lot about that as, as well, where it's augmenting and I completely agree with that approach that it has to be an augmentation it's not taking anyone's job I've been talking about model-based estimating for over a decade and it still hasn't taken anyone's job we still need people that have that intuition that have the insights that un understand those patterns that Randy talked about um, so I think it's really just getting people to understand both sides of it to see their engagement to see that you know, we're really trying to build virtually a project and then build that again and, and develop a plan virtually so that we can do it right the first time. Um, and I think uh, it's just, you know, an understanding of in, intentions and, and, and really getting people to understand that, you know, it's, it's to benefit you, it's to benefit the downstream. And once, once they see that, I think it, it starts to open that up. I see. I see. Thank you very much, Josh. Yeah, I think the flexibility is also very important as well, currently looking at the situations. Absolutely. Uh, yes, um, thank you. Uh, how about Ren? Yeah, I just, to pick up on what Josh was saying, yeah, if you can uh, convince people, well, first you have to convince yourself that leveraging these <laughs> tools, whether it's BIM or AI, will actually deliver value. And then talk about using the tools in terms of the value that it provides. You're much more likely to actually take them up and feel comfortable using them. Um, there's just so many firms who every week mess with a new tool. Uh, maybe a client will, you know, bring it in, or you know, it's just a shiny object. And until we find ways to actually move, uh, move our industry forward, move our firm forward, um, help other people by uh, redefining, leveraging these tools in terms of providing value to them, um, it doesn't happen. The second thing I would just suggest as well is it requires a culture change. It requires, um, if we keep doing the way, things the way we've always done them, there's just no way in the world that we're going to uh, bring these tools together. There's no way we're going to introduce new tools into our organization. Um, there have been a number of times I've been invited to speak about building information modeling only to discover that the vast majority of the people in the audience 
our smaller firms that still use AutoCAD or use CAD instead of BIM and, um, you know, let alone use computational tools or AI and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, to the extent that we can merge the tools we use with each other, um, they, it actually helps us because we're comfortable with one of them. Let's say it's uh, building information modeling. Then you bring in the less familiar one with it. You actually uh, are then able to move a little bit forward in terms of baby steps into the future. Thank you so much, Randy. Yeah, baby step is a good way to start, actually. Yeah, it's wonderful. Um, Haley, how about you? Um, because it um, may, may not be in the, in the, in the way that we look at it, maybe in the way that we design Yeah, I think as someone practicing in um, small practice, particularly, uh, I've definitely seen there's still the, the divide between the architectural design and drafting. And BIM is still, and technology tools are still too often put in the, uh, that's, that's the draftee's job. It's not part of how we design. And I think uh, as we start to break that down, which I think as more and more people are coming through with a variety of skills, both the design skills and the technology skills, then as those people move up through the ranks into practice leaders, I think we'll start to see more of a change through that, but whether that's going to be too late for some firms, I, I suspect it might be because as I sort of said, I think we're going to hit a tipping point where the change just accelerates and um, practices who are still on AutoCAD are just going to be so far behind. Mm -hmm. Understand. Well said, well said. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's another question that we received actually. Uh, maybe I will just read out to everyone. Um, um, this Audience asks, are many modern building designs pose a challenge for facility managers when they are hand over, handing over? Is it common in the design process to put the lease of maintenance and repair lower in the list of consideration? And how do you feel about it? Um, maybe, maybe at this moment, yeah, Randy? Mm -hmm. Well, I was just gonna say, I've, I've, this has come up many times for me in my career as a building designer for 30 years. It, when I'm working on transportation projects, for example, um, you know, maintenance and facilities are at the meetings from day one. And sometimes they would love you just to design uh, a, a concrete bunker in every case with no windows that you can just hose down and clean up. Sometimes it's, you know, it's very cliche that in that sense, but their input is always valuable because it's something that's going to impact them further down the line. And no project is going to move forward unless it addresses um, maintenance and facilities. And so for that reason, even if they're not represented in the early meetings, we still ask those questions. We ask for those pe um, people who represent the, those parts of the project to come into the projects earlier in the process. Um, otherwise you end up just applying band-aids to a design in order to um, address them. So is it common that they're not involved? Yes, it is, unfortunately. But I think proactively, we as designers, at the very least, could uh, make a greater effort um, to bring them in sooner. Yeah, I see. Mm -hmm. How about the rest? Katie and Josh? Um, yes, yeah, certainly we find sometimes there is that involvement from the client side. And, and I would definitely see that more frequently when you've got a client building to operate. Mm -hmm. For some clients, though, where literally they're developing to... Um, to either lease the project and not be responsible for a lot of ongoing maintenance or where they're going to sell it, then they're driven often by lowest dollars yeah. and less swayed by whether it's considerations of operating costs or um, maintenance mm -hmm. or you know the 20 year plus lifespan of their building. I yeah, I, I, I see the same sort of spectrum. So we have some clients that uh, don't think about building maintenance and, and, and any of it at all. And we have others that know uh, exactly what they want. They have spreadsheets. They know, you know, how they want that information. They don't even call it Kobe anymore. It's, it's our version of Kobe kind of thing. Um, several clients I can think of that, that sort of do that. Um, but they are also dealing with the same thing that we are, you know, siloed departments that they're trying to break down and, and have more cross, cross collaboration with. And that includes their facilities maintenance folks and, and knowing 
um, you know, they're getting smarter about understanding that that's where a lot of their, you know, uh, time and, and, and energy and money goes into. Um, and I think that's where a lot of the acceleration of the digital twin concept comes into play and, you know, managing the data and wanting to, to do that. But we're in sort of this state, just like we were with BIM probably, you know, 15, 10 years ago, where they are not quite sure what to ask for, or not all of them are, you know, they're, they're just kind of like going to start saying, well, we want that, but um, we're not really sure what it is yet. And so that's a very wishy-washy time, but I think we can get through that um, pretty quickly and, and, you know, help them understand exactly what they want so that we can have more of those people at the table in those early meetings. Yeah, totally agree. I think sometimes we see a pandemic situation or um, such a situation actually pose a certain kind of opportunities as well. Okay, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for your questions. Okay, um, due to the time constraint at this moment, right, um, maybe we'll just ask the panelists uh, one last question, shall we? Yep. So um, we'll, we would like to have each of the panelists to provide one key takeaway, maybe to end the sessions um, due to the time constraint. Um, may I begin um, with maybe Randy? Sure. Yeah, so mine, I think, is going to be self-apparent. It is the fact that we need to leverage uh, emerging technologies and tools to help us uh, address intractable, wicked problems. But we cannot let the tools do, them, uh, do this on their own. We need to leverage our networks, um, our ability to um, uh, put constraints on the technology, both in terms of ethics, but also in terms of uh, making sure that they're not optimizing for something that um, is either impossible to optimize for or is unnecessary to optimize for just because it can do so. Um, we need to understand why people want to use spaces a certain way, how they'll benefit from it, what the value is that's delivered. And we as humans need to um, assure that the tools um, are doing what they're supposed to do um, as efficiently and effectively as possible. How, Josh? Yeah, I echo some of that. Um, but I was thinking, you know, just in general, I see a lot of change in in the construction side of things, and you know, just wanted to say that, um, you know construction companies are becoming technology companies. You know, I, you heard me talk a little bit about some of the technology that we're developing um, and just sort of thinking about people coming into the workforce, um, you know, and thinking about, uh, you know, this idea that we were talking about prior to COVID uh, about, you know, shortage in workforce and, and different things like that. And I just want to encourage people that there's a lot more to construction um, than just, you know, swinging a hammer. You can see all the digital tools that we're, that we're using here. Um, and, you know, you can, you can be part of, you know, building great things, as we like to say, um, in, in the virtual space as well. Um, but I also want to, you know, emphasize the, the, the soft skills that Randy talked about. Um, those, those, those things are, are, are super important. Um, and also the flexibility and thinking about people first. Um, so anyway, just, just wanted to highlight that, that, you know, construction is changing. Um, we're trying to, you know, accelerate that. And, you know, the, these uh, examples today are, are good examples. Um, and, you know, don't be deterred from, you know, working in construction because of, um, because of these things. Mm, I see, I see. Mm. Uh, how about Katie? I think, as I said, we can certainly see that the pace of change is really accelerating in terms of change in our industry and adaption of technology. But at the same time, things like uh, climate change, the impact of population, and even COVID is, you know, supposedly come from our deforestation and our impact on the environment. And all of those things are accelerating as well. I think what we're seeing though is a, a lot of these trends, are, there were very much a mix of things related to people and to technology. And we're seeing a lot of the things that might benefit people things like choice over where and how we work, um, the things that promote human well-being, designing for nature, incorporating plants, incorporating sensors that can control our light and air quality. These things can also benefit the environmental outcomes as well. So all of these things are sort of coming together to allow us potentially to create better solutions 
meaningful. It's for our built environment, which should have a better impact on the natural environment as well. Totally understandable. That. It's very important to have that all. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Kitty. And thank you so much for the rest of the panelists. Yes, um, now we have come to the end of today's sharing. I hope everyone's gained some fresh insights from these um, discussions and these um, presentations. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all our panelists and attendees. Just a short information. Um, for any collaboration or partnerships, you can connect with us via span at sp.edu.sg. Also, you can also follow us at our social media platforms to find out more about the latest happenings and partnership opportunities, and also look out for the uh, information for our next webinars. Okay, um, thank you so much and have a good afternoon. Thank you, bye-bye.